let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Ekaterina Koldunova. I'm um, associate professor at the Department of Asian and African Studies in Gimo and also uh, a part of ASEAN Center uh, in Gimo in Moscow. We are very privileged to announce the start of uh, the ASEAN, Acad uh, ASEAN Academic Days 2020. And this year we do it uh, in a hybrid format, um, partly online, partly on site, because our audience uh, is mixed. Well, we have students who are majoring in Southeast Asia who are now with me in this room, but unfortunately the facilities doesn't let, uh, do not let us to, uh, to screen uh, them, uh, to show them on, all on the screen. And we have a very prominent lecturer, Mr. Bilahari Kausikan from National University of Singapore, uh, who was so kind to agree to start our program this year. Uh, let me uh, briefly tell you about our house rules. Uh, we kindly ask all the participants to turn off their mics uh, for the period of the speaker's presentation and um, please uh, exercise restraint and uh, respect uh, to our uh, speaker and participants. Um, then I need to notify you that uh, this event is video recorded. So please take it into account. Uh, we are streamlining this event via our university YouTube channel and via our Facebook page. Uh, then what is, what is important is that uh, we will have an opportunity to ask uh, questions and to, uh, well, to comment on uh, what we are to discuss today. So uh, please wait for the, for the opportunity. Uh, the today's schedule is that uh, we will have Mr. Bilahari's uh, presentation for 30 or 40 minutes, according to what uh, what is his preference and his intention will be, and then we will have the opportunity to ask questions and answer uh, and to receive answers. I hope those who are uh, here with me uh, will be asking questions via the mics in this room. So please don't forget to introduce yourself because the speaker will not be able to, to see you. Uh, those who are joining us online, um, please indicate your wish to ask a question uh, by doing uh, one of two things. Either type in your question in the chat, uh, so please find the chat function in, in Zoom, or uh, please raise a blue hand, and I will uh, see that you have raised the blue hand, and it means that you want to, uh, to pose a question by voice. So these are the opportunities. All in all, we have one hour and 20 minutes, uh, our regular class uh, in the university, and uh, probably if there will be too many questions, uh, not all of them will be ad addressed properly, so please do, do understand us. As for our speaker, uh, today's speaker, and uh, his background and his topic, uh, I once again want to express our gratitude to Mr. Bilahari Kosik, and who is currently the chairman of the Middle East Institute in the National University of Singapore, but he has a very... Um, interesting past because he has spent uh, his entire career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He served there for almost uh, 40 years and he had a variety of appointment, appointments including Russian Federation, uh, including uh, the UN, uh, Singapore's uh, office uh, in New York, and uh, he also uh, served as the permanent secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Singapore. Um, he's a prolific writer, and uh, we always uh, happy to read his ideas because they spark a genuine interest to what is going on in the region and to, uh, to see how Southeast Asian representatives view the world. The, today's topic uh, is dedicated to Russia and Southeast Asia, but of course, Mr. Bilahari is free to express his opinions on, on what is going on within ASEAN, what is going on with ASEAN as an, as an organization, and how ASEAN uh, views Russia, 
under the current uh, constraints uh, due to the pandemic. So that's uh, that's the program for today. And then in, in the end, we will have Q&A. Uh, two final uh, points about our audience today. We had a very um, widespread registration, um, which includes uh, participants uh, not only from our university here, but also from other Russian universities, from Singapore, from Thailand, from Indonesia, uh, from the embassies, from the Kyrgyzstan, by the way. So I hope uh, we will enjoy a genuinely uh, productive uh, discussion today. Without any further ado, let me uh, pass the floor to Mr. Bilahari Kosikan. So Mr. Bilahari, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, I am going to go straight to the topic. I am going to spend most of my half an hour or so on ASEAN because I am increasingly convinced that people, not just in Russia, but around the world, fundamentally do not understand the organization. Uh, and from that, as a base, I will say a few words about Russia-ASEAN relations. And then I hope that we can devote most of the question and answer to thinking about ASEAN-Russia relations. If that's okay with you, I'll proceed on that basis. Is that all right? Okay, if it's, I take it that you have no objections. Well, ASEAN is not the uh, first experiment at regional organization in Southeast Asia. During the 1950s and 1960s, there were a number of attempts, all failed. And given that background, it's not surprising perhaps that when ASEAN was formed in 1967, it was greeted with uh, polite skepticism. And ASEAN actually continued to be regarded with skepticism by most countries throughout the 1970s, and it was only in the 1980s that ASEAN began to be taken Take seriously. Uh, and that's because its handling of a certain crisis in Southeast Asia, the Cambodian issue, uh, showed what it could do. Well, ASEAN is now 53 years old, which I dare say is older than most of the people in the audience, which I cannot see. Yet, although all dialogue partners, including Russia, now pay ritual obeisance to the idea of ASEAN's centrality, ASEAN's relevance is still regularly questioned. Not only is it regularly questioned, the criticisms are repetitive. And the prescriptions that follow from those criticisms suggest that after more than half a century, uh, we are still not fundamentally, or we are fundamentally misunderstood. Now, not all of the criticism or the skepticism about ASEAN is unjustified. There are plenty of things to criticize ASEAN about. But as I have uh, on many occasions pointed out, uh, it's utterly pointless to criticize a cow for being an imperfect horse. Uh, if ASEAN, if is, ASEAN to be is to be criticized for the right reasons. For the right reasons. Uh, there's an echo, you know, Professor. There's an echo, you know, Professor. I can hear myself. I can hear myself. We can hear you quite well. No, but I can also hear myself. But I can so also hear myself. So it's... We will uh, try to tackle it. Okay, all right. Anyway, uh, well, as I said, if, we have to, if ASEAN is to be criticized and there is things that it can be criticized about, it should be for the right reasons. So I said, no point criticizing a cow because it's not a horse. And so let me try to explain, and I, and I think this is important for anybody studying Southeast Asia, uh, to, to explain what ASEAN is about and how it works. Uh, and let me take as a point of departure a recent special report, so-called special report, entitled Built for Trust, Not for Conflict, ASEAN Faces the Future. It was prepared for the US Institute for Peace, and I'm taking it as a convenient point of departure because it's a typical example of the genre of ASEAN criticism. Now, I don't want to misrepresent the argument of this report, so let me use the author's own executive summary. There are only a few points. Uh, first point, ASEAN was designed as a trust-building mechanism for its members rather than as a platform for mediating disputes. Second point, historically, ASEAN has been able to minimize interstate conflicts because of adherence to the principles of consensus, non-interference, and the peaceful resolution of disputes. 
is many meetings and informal social gatherings built interpersonal trust, enabling many disputes to be settled without resort to formal legal mechanisms. This emphasis, and this is the third point, this emphasis, however, prevents it from effectively intervening in intrastate conflicts considered domestic issues. Nor is it equipped to handle interstate disagreements that cannot be resolved on the sidelines of meetings. Four points. Pressure on ASEAN to reform its structure and culture comes from the changing security dynamic and the influence of external actors in the region, particularly China and the United States. And the last point, one of the most pressing issues for consideration is the continued relevance and feasibility of, us, feasibility of ASEAN's principle or consensus-based decision-making in the light of emerging challenges presented by increasing US-China competition. Now, this is a very standard line of argument and the conclusion that we should rethink consensus decision building is also standard. I can't remember how many hundreds of times I've heard, I've heard that argument. But it is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the purpose of ASEAN. ASEAN is not designed as a trust building mechanism. It is true that ASEAN's fundamental purpose is to manage relations between its members and ASEAN projects are as important as means to this fundamental end as they are important in themselves. But ASEAN manages relations not so much by building trust, but by managing mistrust. We don't build trust, we manage mistrust. And that's not the same thing. And so if the first premise is wrong, all that follows cannot but be error. Uh, ASEAN emerged from the ferment of post-World War II Southeast Asia and the very complicated processes of decolonization and nation building that were carried out at that time in the context of the Cold War. And there were two questions that needed to be answered by all countries in that situation at that time. The immediate question was how to deal with the Indonesia, a newly independent Indonesia that had just ended Konfrontasi. Konfrontasi was an undeclared war that Indonesia under President Sukarno waged against Malaysia and after Singapore was separated from Malaysia against Malaysia and Singapore between 1966, 1963 and 1966. That was the immediate question. How do we deal with Indonesia? The broader question was how to avoid getting drawn into the proxy conflicts raging on the mainland. Now, I don't want to go into the details of the causes of confrontation, but because they are in, they lay essentially in Indonesian domestic politics. But as a distinguished scholar of Southeast Asia, the late George McTunan Kehin, who taught at Cornell University, wrote in 1964, while confrontasi was ongoing, he said, and I quote, the most fundamental reason is the powerful self-righteous trust of Indonesian nationalism. Among Indonesians, there has developed a widely held belief that because of the country's size and armed power and because it won its independence through revolution, it has a moral right to leadership in Asia." End of quote. Now, what ought to be obvious to everyone is that Indonesia's size and its consequent presumption of leadership is a permanent condition. Indonesia is never going to become smaller. And Indonesia is bigger than all the other ASEAN countries combined. And it is now stronger than it was in the 1960s. And what Professor Kehin described 56 years ago is still an accurate description of Indonesian attitudes, although it is now more discreet in its manifestations and they don't emphasize their revolutionary past anymore. Now, Southeast Asia's most salient characteristic is diversity. Diversity based on primordial factors such as race and religion. And their influence was manifest in many of the events leading up to ASEAN's formation. Uh, the racial element, for example, was explicit in one earlier attempt at regionalism, Mephilindo, which was, the acronym is formed by the combination of the names of Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia. Now, primordial identities based on race and religion are also permanent factors. In principle, of course, you can change your religion, but in Southeast Asia, race and religion are closely correlated. So this is 
changing of religion is much more a theoretical than a practical pro proposition. And race and religion are still the fundamental driving forces of politics and international relations in Southeast Asia. Now, ASEAN kept the peace in Southeast Asia and has been very successful at that by easing the innate suspicions, the complications and the tensions that are attendant upon these two permanent factors, Indonesia's size and race and religion. But ASEAN did not and cannot erase them. Permanent conditions are permanent. Like chronic diseases, they can be ameliorated, they can be managed, but they will never go away. Uh, now, time and the accumulated express experience of working together has built more mutual confidence. That's certainly true. And blunted the sharper edges of these factors. But they are still there lurking beneath ASEAN's surface civilities and not so deeply buried as to prevent them from still occasionally surfacing in new forms. And I think that prospect of them surfacing is even higher today than it was, let us say, a decade ago or maybe even five years ago. Why? Because we live in an age when identity politics is asserting itself globally. And Southeast Asia is no exception. Uh, as what, what one scholar has called, and I quote, the rising politics of indigeneity in Southeast Asia becomes more prominent, as unfortunately I think it will, the risk of these primordial factors resurfacing can only rise. Now, decision-making by consensus and its corollary, non-interference in internal affairs, is the only practical means of managing these permanent conditions. These principles have sometimes been modified in practice. Uh, in fact, quite often they have been modified in practice, but they cannot be abandoned as operating principles. Why? Consensus decision-making reassures the small that the big cannot impose its will upon them. Consensus decision making reassures the big that the small cannot gang up against it. Any other means of taking decisions will only accentuate innate suspicions and risk even small disagreements escalating into major conflicts. Let me state the point. This is a very fundamental point about how ASEAN works. Let me state the point in another way. ASEAN's fundamental consensus is always to have a consensus, even if it is only a consensus of form and not substance. ASEAN tries to avoid discussing issues where it is obvious there will be no consensus. And this is why ASEAN's characteristic mode of expression is very indirect, sometimes to the point of obscurity or meaninglessness, and why ASEAN does not try to solve or even have a position on every issue. Uh, or to restate the point in yet another way, the fundamental consensus is always to preserve the organization, even if it means doing nothing. <laughs> now, the failure, you must all, uh, any student of Southeast Asia heard of, has heard of this, the failure of the Phnom Penh ASEAN ministerial meeting in July 2012 to agree on a joint communique because Cambodia, then in the chair, refused to accept any compromise on language on the South China Sea was therefore shocking and could have posed an existential crisis. Fortunately, that post proved to be an exceptional situation. Uh, only a week after that meeting, the next week actually, due to the tireless efforts of the then Indonesian Foreign Minister, Marty Nata Legawa, consensus was reached on six principles of the South China Sea. And the language of the six principles was largely taken from previously eaten documents and that has formed the basis of ASEAN's consensus on this issue, the South China Sea, ever since. Uh, Cambodia and sometimes Laos has on occasion been difficult over this issue, but so far nobody has been as foolishly intransigent as in 2012. Uh, not even the Chinese, actually. Now, speaking uh, about a year after what happened in Phnom Penh, Hun Sen said supporting China was and I quote, Cambodia's political choice. Now, that betrayed Cambodia's lack of understanding of how ASEAN works. We are an interstate and not a supranational organization. No member is ever required to give up its sovereign right to define its national interests as it chooses. And Cambodia's right to make its political choices was never at issue. 
But as the late Mr. S. Rajaratnam, Singapore's first foreign minister, put it at the signing of the Bangkok Declaration in 1967, henceforth we had to, avoid, uh, to adopt a new way of thinking in which the regional interests had to be some part of each member's definition of national interests. And the other four foreign ministers of the original members made much the same point in their own ways. Now, ASEAN's original members had differences of interest that were in some cases much more fundamental than Cambodia's support for China over the South China Sea. Compared to some of the earlier disagreements, that's a relatively minor matter. For example, the Philippines' claim to Sabah led Malaysia to boycott some early ASEAN meetings. The role of foreign bases in Southeast Asia almost led Singapore to walk out of the foreign ministers' meeting drafting the Bangkok Declaration. We almost didn't join us yet. And at the end of the 1980s, during the end game in Cambodia, Indonesia again tried to impose its will as a regional hegemon. But the sense that the regional interests had to be part of the national interests held ASEAN together and eventually compromises were found. Now that sense, that sense that the regional interests must be part of your national interests, that they are not alternatives, <laughs> they are actually compatible. That sense is undoubtedly less strong in some of the newer members. And in the case of Cambodia, its tragic and traumatic history is perhaps responsible for the overly transactional, narrow and short-term calculations of interest. I think it was a mistake for ASEAN to have hastily expanded its membership in the 1990s without adequate socialization of new members. But that's all water under the bridge. And it doesn't mean if we didn't socialize mem new members then, all is lost. Because the most powerful and enduring type of socialization comes from the pressure of events. Now whatever, and let me give you an example of this, whatever the suspicions and animosities the original five members harbored against each other, and they were great, the animosities were great and deep, they were all non-communist or anti-communist and faced armed communist insurgencies supported by China. And with war raging on the mainland, it was min to minimize the opportunity for external interventions taking advantage of intra-regional conflicts to embroil ASEAN in Cold War proxy conflicts that uh, provided the original impetus to manage mistrust. But the extension of that impetus to the idea that peace and stability could best be secured by excluding the major powers from the region, which found expression in Zotfan, the zone of peace, freedom and neutrality, and in later in the Southeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone, was impractical to the point of being uh, delusional. Now, being occasionally delusional or saying things that sound delusional is the unfortunate price we pay for having a consensus on always having a consensus. We don't really expect others to take these occasional flights of fancy seriously, but regrettably and not to our credit, they sometimes do. ASEAN's Zofan's main champions were Malaysia and Indonesia. Now, around the time, same time as Zofan was proclaimed, the US 7th Fleet and the then Soviet Union's Pacific Fleet administered a strong dose of cold reality to these two countries. Because these two countries, by ignoring the claim of these two countries, that the Straits of Malacca was not an international waterway. Uh, that claim stemmed from the same impulse that led to Zofan. So the Soviet Union and the US, in a rare act of unanimity during the Cold War, sent their warships through the Straits, up and down to the Straits, and Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur could only watch helplessly. Now, that was a very shocking lesson to these countries, but the sentiment didn't entirely go away. In 1990, a combination of Filipino domestic politics and natural disasters forced the US out of Subic Bay and Clark Air Base. Singapore and the U.S. signed a memorandum of understanding that allowed U.S. limited use of some of our facilities. That was in 1990. Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur reacted as if we had conspired with the devil to sell their firstborn children into slavery. But in 2005, we concluded an enhanced MOU 
to continue the use of the facilities, the reaction was muted. And last year, in 2019, when an even more enhanced and comprehensive renewal was signed by Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong and President Trump during the UNGA in New York around this time, uh, with all the fanfare that always accompanies any Trump event, it did not attract any attention, no criticism, not even a whisper. Uh, it, Malaysia and Indonesia have built their own defense ties with the US and the Seventh Fleet makes port calls in both these countries, uses their facilities and conduct joint exercises with them. What happened? Well, although they may not be prepared to publicly say so, Chinese, China's increasing assertiveness, if not outright aggressiveness in the South China Sea and on other issues, brought home to them the idea that only balance among major powers rather than their self-restraint could ensure stability in Southeast Asia. He also underscored the irreplaceable role of the US in any balance. And the formation of the ASEAN Regional Forum, followed by the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, marked a significant, if unannounced, shift in ASEAN's official regional security concept. Why? Because they all encourage and entrench the natural multipolarity of a strategic crossroads where the interests of several major powers inevitably intersect. There will always be more than one major power with interest in the region. That is why Southeast Asia has never ever fallen under the sway of any single external power, except for a short and historically exceptional period of Japanese occupation. And we know it didn't end well for Japan. Now, the region's multipolarity is not symmetrical. Very clearly, the US and China are in a league of their own. But multipolarity, even if asymmetrical, maximizes maneuver space for ASEAN. The ASEAN-led forums are coherent enough to be supplementary means for all the major powers to promote their interests in Southeast Asia and thereby anchor them to the region and to ASEAN, but not so strong as to be able to block anything vital to them, to the major powers. And that's precisely why they find ASEAN useful. An analogy would be why uh, the five permanent members of the Security Council have the veto. And that's why the UN has survived, where its predecessor, the League of Nations, is now history. And this is the real meaning of ASEAN centrality. The point I'm trying to make, it was the pressure of events and not the persuasive powers of any Singapore or other ASEAN diplomat that had reservations about Zopfan that caused Malaysia and Indonesia to rethink their priorities and quietly drop Zopfan in favor of this kind of multipolar balance. A similar dynamic may be beginning on the mainland of Southeast Asia, where the dams that China is building on the upper reaches of the Mekong pose, pose potentially existential issues to downriver riparian countries particularly the less developed ones like Laos and Cambodia. Now, Hun Sen has called China Cambodia's most trustworthy friend. Not every Cambodian would agree, and certainly not when it comes to an existential issue. The leaders of Cambodia and Laos may not care very much about what happens in the South China Sea. Laos is, after all, landlocked. But they must care about what happens to a river on which the livelihood, indeed the survival, of a very large part of their population depends. If they are indifferent, their people will eventually force them to care. And Cambodia, not too long ago, suspended two dam projects, two dam projects due to uh, domestic opposition. So the utility of making the regional interest some part of their national interest will eventually sink home to these countries as it has to the original five members. The strategic instinct of a Southeast Asia that has lived in the midst of great power competition for centuries is not to align with any major power across all domains. The Southeast Asia diplomatic instinct is to hedge, to balance and to ban wagons simultaneously, not allowing a tactic it may adopt on one issue, say ban wagoning, to dictate its approach to another issue or in a different domain where it may hedge or balance. Consistency is not necessarily a virtue. Now, I once asked a senior Vietnamese official, my counterpart actually, what a change of leadership in Hanoi would mean for Vietnam's relations with China. 
This was his reply. Every Vietnamese leader, he replied, must get along with China and must stand up with China. And if you cannot do both at the same time, you don't deserve to be the leader. In different degrees and in different ways, every ASEAN member has much the same attitude, not just towards China, but towards the US as well, and in fact, towards every major power. Yes, including Russia. Uh, US-China competition is not a new Cold War although journalists and some, even some academics like to call it so. This is an intellectually lazy trope which downplays the complexity of a relationship in which deep mistrust coexists with interdependence of a type and depth never before seen in strategic rivals and certainly did not exist between the US and the Soviet Union. The US and China are entangled in supply chains of an intricacy of a scope uh, that never before existed in the world economy. And this makes it improbable that they, may, that they will be able to decouple across all domains, although selective decoupling in certain fields has already begun. Now, coping with this will not be easy, but the very complexity and the ambivalence of US-China relations, indeed all post-Cold War major power relationships, provides ample scope for the exercise of the Southeast Asian instinct not to structure strategic alignments consistently across the entire gamut of issues or on the basis of only one dimension of its relationship with any major power. And this is what we mean when we say we do not want to take sides in US-China competition. It means we will sometimes tilt one way and sometimes tilt the other way or go our own way as our own interests dictate. There is an assumption prevalent in many Western countries, particularly in the US, that we in Southeast Asia are also irredeemably corrupt or so terminally naive as to cynically sell our national interests to China or cheerfully ignore them in our relationships with China. Of course, we do not shun Chinese trade and investment. Why should we? And of course, China is a major economic partner to all the ASEAN countries. But we do know our own interests, and even if we have an economic interest with China, it does not preclude us from having different interests with the US, with Russia, with Japan, or with some other power. We see no reason to align all our interests across different domains with any single power. Now, China is already facing pushback even from countries highly dependent on its trade and investment and who participate in its signature Belt and Road projects. Southeast Asian attitudes towards China are complex and fraught with ambivalence. And for those of you who are interested in Southeast Asia-China relations, I can strongly recommend you two new books, one by Sebastian Strangle called In the Dragon's Shadow, and one by Murray Hebert called In Beijing's Shadow. Uh, they are both excellent books that bring out very well the complexity and the, uh, the complexity of Southeast Asian attitudes towards China. It goes country by country, and they are both very good books. I, uh, strongly recommend them. Uh, Southeast Asian attitudes towards China are complex and fraught with ambivalence. And so too are Southeast Asian attitudes towards the US, complex and fraught with ambivalence. The US and China are both acknowledged as important, but neither, for different reasons, is particularly trusted. And this is validated by successive surveys carried out among South in Southeast Asia. As a contiguous big country, China is always going to enjoy significant influence in Southeast Asia. But for precisely the same reasons, China is also going to evoke anxieties, which Beijing has done little to assuage and under Xi Jinping have been enhanced. China, countries on China's periphery will therefore not allow themselves to be totally hemmed in, no matter how dependent they are on China. Significant influence is not exclusive or dominant influence and the natural multipolarity of the region, as I said, maximizes room for maneuver and the exercise of agency by members of ASEAN. Now, of course, whether we have the wit to recognize the opportunities for maneuver and the agility and the courage to use our agency are different matters. And our trajectory of development has not been straight and will never be straight, never be continual progress along a straight line. We're always going to move forward with pauses and by meanderings. But, and this is a valid criticism of ASEAN, uh, in recent years, there are signs that ASEAN's strategic horizons are narrowing, 
signs that some members prefer to rest on past laurels rather than break new ground, and even of what the unkind may call timidity creeping into ASEAN decision making. And this is not because a new generation of officials and political leaders dealing with ASEAN have inferior intellects or queasier stomachs than their predecessors. The causes are structural and have to do with the evolution of domestic politics in key ASEAN states. From the 1960s to the 1980s, and even up to the early 1990s, all the ASEAN members were authoritarian states of some degree. And this was when ASEAN was able to take many seminal decisions, many very tough decisions, not the least of which was to form ASEAN in the first place. And the hard, if politically correct, incorrect fact is that authoritarian systems are better at certain things. And one of those things is pursuing long-term goals and taking tough, tough decisions without giving public opinion too much consideration. It is now much more difficult for the pluralistic political systems that have evolved in several ASEAN members uh, since the late 1990s, even uh, countries that still have communist or Leninist systems like Vietnam and Laos have to take public opinion into, more into consideration than in the past. Uh, too often leaders shape rather than, uh, follow rather than shape public opinion. And that's why it's, it's much more difficult for ASEAN to reach consensus on difficult issues these days. Now, I'm not arguing for ASEAN members to return to authoritarianism. That is clearly impossible and it's not desirable on other grounds. It's only a gentle reminder to those who have a penchant for looking at political developments in Southeast Asia in simplistic terms, mostly in the West, as the advance or retreat for democracy is to be careful about what you wish for and that few things are either wholly bad or wholly good. Now the key to the ASEAN's future, to key to anything that happens in ASEAN is Indonesia. The reason why ASEAN survived and even prospered while other attempts at regional organization fail essentially amounts to the difference between President Suharto and President Sukarno. Suharto was no less a nationalist than his predecessor, but chose to assert Indonesian nationalism in a fundamentally different way. Post Suharto, Indonesia has yet to establish a stable new internal equilibrium. And it's important to remember that Indonesia is not just a geographic place. Indonesia is also and more fundamentally an idea. And since 1945, when Indonesia became independent, the idea of Indonesia has been a contested idea. Will it be a secular nationalist idea of Indonesia or an Islamist nationalist idea of Indonesia? Indonesia's first two presidents suppressed the contest by force in favor of the former, in favor of a secular nationalist idea. But after Suharto's fall, that contest is now again the main axis of Indonesian politics. What the outcome of that contest will be, I do not know. But where Indonesia goes, ASEAN ultimately goes. No major power can hold ASEAN without holding Indonesia. Domestic politics will influence the details of Indonesia's future strategic alignments. But since nationalism of one variant or another is the common factor in the contest over the idea of Indonesia, it's either going to be secular nationalism or Islamist nationalism. Uh, whatever the outcome of the domestic contest is unlikely to change the broad strategic trajectory of Indonesian foreign policy. Since the 1950s, Indonesia has accepted significant amounts of aid, trade and investment from the West, from the former Soviet Union and from Maoist China. But ultimately, it has gone its own way, eluding all attempts to capture it and frustrating all that have tried. And President Xi Jinping's China is learning the same lesson as Maoist China learned. To put things bluntly, China is learning not, that not everyone can be bought and the bought do not always stay bought and even the corrupt can be nationalists. Since the 19th century, nationalism has proven to be the most potent and enduring global force. It overcame empire, overcame communism, and virulent ethno-nationalisms of various kinds are now pressing hard against the civic nationalisms of many Western democracies. 
nationalism cannot and will not be denied. ASEAN is often compared consciously or unconsciously with the EU. Until recently, when the EU's feet of clay were exposed, the comparison was not to ASEAN's advantage. But the comparison is false, although the essential issue that the EU and ASEAN were both intended to address is similar. Now, after Bismarck united Germany in 1871, a fundamental imbalance rose in the heart of Europe. And it took millions of deaths caused by two world wars and a holocaust before Europe settled upon Eurigionalism as a solution. It worked quite well for a while. So after Germany was reunited in 1990 and the imbalance re-emerged in a new form, deeper and more ambitious regionalism through the EU, union and community through the pooling of sovereignties, the denial of nationalism seemed the solution. But this was a step far too far. Unlike its predecessors, the EU is based on a fundamental internal contradiction. It is supposed to be a post-nationalist community, but it is based on fears of a superior German nationalism. This is a fundamental contradiction at the heart of the EU, and it is a construct that denies a basic human instinct, which is the need for identity, of which national identity is always a core and enduring component. And many of the problems with which the EU is now struggling with stem from these internal contradictions. ASEAN has done better. Indonesia's size posed as potentially a destabilizing influence in the heart of Southeast Asia as Germany did in Europe. Perhaps because we are modest Asians rather than sanctimonious Europeans, we are less stubborn about ideas and we did not have to wade through oceans of blood to deal with this potentially catastrophic catastrophic issue. It only took a minor undeclared war and a few failed experiments in regionalism for us to find a solution that stabilized Southeast Asia. Our solution, moreover, is not based on a futile denial of human nature. It did not require the suppression of nationalism. It did not require Indonesia or any other nationalism to subordinate itself to some other nationalism or some supranational ideal. We may talk in ASEAN about community, but we don't really mean it in the same way as the Europeans mean it when they use the word community. Our community is in lowercase, without a capital C. ASEAN, instead of denying nationalism, harnessed nationalism by appealing to the value that all nationalists, whatever their other animosities, hold in common when confronted with the nationalisms of bigger and more powerful states and that value is autonomy. The key problem that ASEAN was designed to manage is not so much the intrastate and interstate conflicts, because those are managing that is an instrument towards a larger end, and that larger end is how to maintain autonomy in the midst of great power rivalries. This is what holds ASEAN together. ASEAN's essential premise was pithily summarized by an Indonesian slogan, whose basic point was essentially similar to Rajaratnam's idea of the regional interest being part of the national interest. And that slogan is this, national resilience enhances regional resilience and regional resilience enhances national resilience. Regionalism play, based on nationalism is a theoretical contradiction in terms, but it works in practice. It's often messy. It sometimes operates by disregarding our own stated principles and procedures it often results in suboptimal outcomes and its ambitions are limited, but it has proven enduring for precisely these reasons. It does not seek perfection. Let me conclude with a few words for ASEAN on ASEAN-Russia relations, which I hope will form the basis for a discussion through question and answers on ASEAN-Russia relations. It follows from everything I have said, and that's why I have said it, that it follows from everything I've said about ASEAN's natural disinclination to align all aspects to, of relations with any single power that we would welcome a relationship with Russia. And that is why Russia was invited to join the ARF, the ES, and the ADMM+. But the potential of ASEAN-Russia relations has not been fulfilled. And I've spent a lot of time during my career and after thinking about why this is so. Uh, in 2012, I was a member of the ASEAN-Russia Eminent Persons Group that was supposed to make recommendations 
on how to advance ASEAN-Russia relations to be considered by the Sochi summit that was held later that year. We came up with a document of some sort, uh, but it was clear to me, and I think it was clear to the other members, both Russian and from ASEAN, that neither side had really thought through what realistically, realistically and practically we could do to enhance relations with each other. Uh, it was an exercise in form, not substance. This sort of exercise is not unfamiliar with to ASEAN, and I dare say to Russia too. It's sometimes necessary, but it was nevertheless a wasted opportunity. Both sides need very urgently, both the Russian side and the ASEAN side need urgently to sit down, sit down individually in their own groups and together to seriously think about their relationships and what, I repeat this, we can practically and realistically do together. If you look at the EPG document, it's a very long list, a long laundry list of things that are neither practical nor realistic to do together. And on that, I, I will end and I invite your questions. Thank you, Mr. Bilahari. I think that uh, uh, we all have many ideas emerged out of your uh, very intellectually rich uh, talk. Uh, so I now invite our virtual audience and our on-site uh, audience to think about what they want to to ask and discuss and meanwhile uh, people are uh, trying to get their ideas in in proper order let me uh, utilize my position as a moderator and ask the first question can you hear me properly uh, is the yes, sound okay okay so uh, i will pose a question and meanwhile please uh, our uh, students in the in this room and our virtual audience indicate your wish to ask a question either by typing in chat or um, raising a blue hand here i see that we uh, start to have a line uh, of people willing to ask a question so my question is uh, is related to the current situation because we all are under uh, certain limitations due to the uh, COVID pandemic, and unfortunately, we cannot interact face to face. Uh, we all feel that computer is not a proper substitute to the uh, to the formal and informal personal communication. So, uh, what is your feeling? How is ASEAN way working under these constraints uh, when uh, informal consultations, informal talks uh, cannot be proper uh, organized and streamlined? Uh, is there any difference in how ASEAN has been operating uh, in the past several months? Thank you. Well, as you yourself put it, it's been operating, the machine is going on, but not in a very good way. I think anybody who has been a diplomat or who are now diplomats will know that there is no substitute for personal interaction. Uh, online, uh, in a formal diplomatic stand, setting or informal, even informal, all you can do is make speeches. And speeches are important, but speeches are just speeches. But I think the Vietnamese chair has done a very good job in keeping the machine going under very difficult circumstances. And we can only hope that you know, the pandemic situation gets, back, uh, it gets eased as quickly as possible so we can go back to you know, the normal way of diplomacy. So let's just uh, wait and see how it will work out and uh, waiting I mean, for the end of lockdown. Yeah, so we we try to do our best. Do we have any questions in the from the audience here? Can I invite someone to join here, please, uh, Dasha? But uh, please do indicate yourself. Turn on the mic, and after the question from the audience here, I will turn the floor to Nigel Lee, who indicated his wish via uh, chat, and then we will uh, continue. I see the blue hands. Thanks. Don't uh, uh, drop them. Keep them uh, standing in the uh, in the chat. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daria. I'm a master student here in Gimo University, and my question is uh, rather actual. Um, I would like to know how is uh, Russian vaccine is seen in the Southeast Asian countries, and uh, actually, um, in your opinion. Uh, how did interactions uh, between Russia and Southeast Asian countries change 
uh, during this um, COVID pandemic. Thank you. Well, to be very frank, I think people are looking at the Russian vaccine with a certain degree of skepticism because it was such a quick, uh, it was, it seemed to be rushed. I don't think anybody has ruled it out because we need a vaccine, right? Nobody has ruled it out, but nobody is eagerly embracing it either. Now, that, don't feel discriminated against in Russia because I don't think anybody is rushing to embrace Chinese vaccines or American vaccines or anybody's vaccines because none really have been com comprehensively tested yet. Uh, now, the other question is slightly different. You know, I, uh, how is what's... How is Russia's relations with ASEAN under these co this pandemic uh, conditions? Well, again, it's not ideal. But the much more fundamental problem is, I think, as I said at the end of my talk, I think we have not sat down, either individually or collectively, to seriously and realistically and practically think how we can bring this relationship together. Our, our general attitude welcomes a role for Russia in Southeast Asia and ASEAN because multipolarity is in our interest, because multipolarity maximizes maneuver room. But I think the fact is, and I think uh, that the potential of this relationship is still at a very early phase, it has not been realized. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to invite Nigel Lee uh, from Singapore and also a GIMO student to ask his question. Then I will turn the floor to Alessia, student here, and then Jenny uh, from Kyrgyzstan, who raised her blue hand, will be welcome. Get prepared, please. Uh, hello, Mr. Belahari. It's nice to see you again. We bumped into each other a few weeks ago at uh, yeah, Kino Kamiya. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, so um, thank you for your talk. Uh, very interesting. and. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a continuation of your, your last few uh, notes uh, in your talk about Russian ASEAN relations. We, we've already, we, are, we are already aware of how difficult it is for ASEAN to come up with a coordinated approach to China. So how uh, can we expect ASEAN to do the same for a country like Russia? Uh, perhaps- it will be easier. It'll be easier. easier. If we can really sit down, it'll be easier because we start from a very low base. So many mm. of the complications, and Russia is not contiguous to Southeast Asia. Right? Right? Uh, so I think actually it'll be easier. The, uh, the point I, I have made is that we, we in ASEAN huh, have never actually sat down together, 10 of us, or even when we were five, and uh, seriously discuss what exactly can we realistically want to get out of Russia. And, and what can we offer Russia? And I don't think, frankly, from my experience in the APG, the Russian side has done so either. I'll give you one example. One of the, one of the um, proposals that came from the Russian side, which we put into the APG document because it was just a laundry list, was to have a gas pipeline all the way from East Russian Dani Vostok to Southeast Asia to sell us gas. And I took my friend aside, used to be in the foreign ministry, I said, hey, friend, you know this is ridiculous, right? And I know why you're putting forward because Gazprom is a very important uh, player in Russia. So I understand. I won't object to putting this into the into the um, uh, into the document because I know you have to advocate this. But you know this cannot work because look at the cost of pumping the gas all the way from there to Southeast Asia. I said, why don't you all explore LNG? Well, I know the reason why Russia does not really explore LNG in a very serious way. But you should, because then you have another connection to Southeast Asia, because energy is certainly something all of us needs. And we don't want to be overly dependent on Middle East energy or anybody else's energy. Let's just give you one example about sitting down and talking to each other in a serious and practical way. But I think it's actually going to be easier with Russia for ASEAN to have a common position uh, than with China or even with the United States. Okay, we turn back to the audience here. Thank you, Nigel and uh, Alessi, please. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, dear participants. I'm Alessi Kusaeva, third year student in regional studies in Gimo University, uh, studying Thai and Lao languages. Uh, and I'd like to thank Dr. Bill Harry for his enriching speech. 
uh, my question is, do you think that ASEAN needs to move towards the next level of integration or the existing level satisfies the aims of organization? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm not a doctor of any kind, all right? Secondly, you must be a very brave woman to go and study Thai and Lao languages. This must, must be one of the most difficult languages in the whole world. <laughs> Good luck to you. Uh, but no, I... It depends what you mean by the next level of integration. If you mean something like the EU, like the EU, no, because it's not working very well in the EU either. But in certain specific fields, we do have certain ambitions of moving forward while maintaining the essentially interstate not uh, of character of the organization. Don't forget, ASEAN is not a supranational organization. It is based on nationalism rather than trying to futilely deny nationalism as the EU. I once asked an EU person, what do you mean by pooling of sovereignties? That's a contradiction in terms. How do you pool sovereignties? It's not possible unless one of you conquers the rest. And that has been tried twice in, in modern history and it didn't work very well, right? And he was not very happy. No, so we are not going to go that direction. If that's what you mean by the next level of integration, no way we are going to go in that direction because it just doesn't work. But if you mean on specific projects, yes, we should be able to we have an ambition, for example, to create a common market and a common production platform in Southeast Asia. That doesn't require pooling of sovereignties, whatever it means, but it is a new target that we have set ourselves. Uh, we can do better in areas like environmental protection, uh, both in the mainland and in maritime Southeast Asia. And there are other areas where we can certainly do better. But if you mean change the model of regional realism in Southeast Asia to something like the EU, then that is not going to happen. And I hope it will not happen because it will be a disaster. Thank you. Uh, I see that Anastasia Petachko from High School of Economics would like to ask something. Uh, Anastasia, please turn on your mic and uh, ask the question. Uh, hello, thank you very much for this interesting lecture. Um, uh, I'm in very interested in your thought about the thing that China has learned that you can buy anyone and uh, I actually like it. Uh, so could you please elaborate a little bit on this topic? Uh, what do you think about the future of infrastructure projects that ASEAN is involved in in these conditions? Uh, what would be the Chinese strategy, and especially taking into account the world recession due to COVID circumstances? Thank you. Okay, I think not just in Southeast Asia, but throughout the world, the Chinese will have to take a, a more cautious approach to such projects. And there are two reasons for this. One, there has been considerable pushback against these projects not just in Southeast Asia, where several projects have been suspended, abandoned, scaled down, but uh, in almost every region where there are these projects. Uh, so th because the liabilities as well as the positive sides of these projects are becoming um, evident. The other reason is that China, rich as it is, as much money as it has, it does not have infinite money. A lot of these projects are just economically unviable. A lot in the first phase of the Belt and Road, a lot of these projects were taken for no other reason, I believe, than just to please the boss. I put it this way, <laughs> right? And this is not. Uh, I think the Chinese themselves do recognize that this is not sustainable over the long run <laughs> for them, you know, because they have. Don't forget, China is still in many ways in many regions, still a relatively undeveloped country. They have a lot of domestic needs that they must fulfill. I don't know whether you pay any attention to Chinese domestic politics, but if you read Mr. Xi Jinping's speech at the 19th Party Congress three years ago, uh, I think Western commentators in particular got it completely wrong. What they focus on is the great ambition that was manifest in that speech. But that, to me, was nothing unusual. Big countries have big ambitions. What's so strange about that, right? I mean, what, it would be strange if big countries did not have big ambitions. What was more important about that speech is Xi Jinping's uh, redefinition of the principal contradiction facing China. And that he redefined, and I'm trying to quote from memory, as 
the contradiction between China's inadequate and unbalanced development and the Chinese people's ever-growing expectations, no, ever-growing need for a better life. In other words, rising expectations. And from that, there's a huge complicated agenda, all domestic, and this has to be fulfilled in the context of an aging population in China. Uh, they need a lot of money for that. So they will have to take a more cautious, a more prudent approach towards infrastructure projects. They're not going to stop and they should not stop because there is a great need for infrastructure throughout the uh, world, not just in Southeast Asia. But both sides are going to be more careful. They're going to have to do their homework in a more uh, considered way before deciding whether or not to go ahead with any particular project. That's already happening. Okay, we have a participant, uh, Jenny, please do indicate where are you based now, in Kyrgyzstan or in, in Singapore, and please pose your question, turn on your mic and uh, voice up. Hello, uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Komsikan, actually... I'm, I'm a professor. <laughs> okay. I'm the graduate student from Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, wow. uh, National yeah. University of Singapore. So I'm based in Singapore now, but originally yeah. I'm from uh, Kyrgyzstan. Actually, yeah. like uh, not long time ago, you delivered a public lecture at our school. So I'm really glad to see you again. My question is, I would like to get your comments on, um, okay, last year in 2019, Singapore signed the FTA, which is free trade agreement with the Eurasian Economic Union, right? So this is Russia, and we have two Central Asian countries, which is Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Belarus, and Armenia. So living and studying more than a year in Singapore, I know like Singapore value pragmatism. So it is, as you mentioned previously, we need to think on some practical and the realistic opportunities of working together. This is a very typical Singaporean approach. My question is first, what kind of practical and realistic opportunities Singapore governments see working with Eurasian Economic Union. And also, second question is, taking into account the China's China leading Belt and Road Initiative has been a very widespread, in East, especially like Central Asian region and so on. So how do you think Singapore role signing this FTA, like balancing between the Eurasian Economic Union and the Belt and Road, what's that mean like between these two regional like uh i mean unions all together how singapore want to play out the role thank you so much oh, to be very honest with you if you look at the eurasian economic union there are only two main it made the two main economies of interest to us are russia and kazakhstan i'm not saying we cannot do anything with kyrgyzstan you have a beautiful country i've been there uh or armenia or, or any other country. i'm also realistic but, I'm fine. <laughs> But, but, you know, the two main economies are Russia and, and Kazakhstan. That's why we signed the Eurasian Economic Union. I mean, if we could have bilateral FTAs with Russia or uh, uh, Kazakhstan, we would. But now you have the European Eurasian Economic Union and we have to respect your, your, your rules, right? That's why. Now, the Belt and Road, yeah, it's going to be important. I don't think, again, in Central Asia, I think some projects are going to work better than other projects. And you should know that there have been some complaints among Central Asian countries too about some belt, some aspects of the Belt and Road projects. So I think you know it's Central Asia is a huge region. You know there will be always opportunities for a small country like Singapore because we don't have huge ambitions like we want, like the Belt and Road. Our ambitions are much more scaled down to our size. I give you one um, example taken from Russia. Some years ago, when I was still in the ministry. Uh, some, some senior Russian officials was talking to me. We are having bilateral consultations and he was telling me, he was telling me we should play a role in the development of the Russian Far East and Siberia and so on. I said, we will, you know, but the things he was talking about got me alarm. I said, my friend, you understand, right? If you take Singapore and drop it into just the Russian Far East, uh, we will never be found again. Uh, so be realistic in your expectations, what we can do. And what we can do, we will do, of course, in our own interest. You know, for example, Vladivostok Airport, that's a good project, and I think we are, we are, we are, we are happy to do it. So even likewise, in Central Asia, it's a huge region. Uh, it's even larger than the Russian Far East because it, it stretches from the Russian Far East right down to the Kafkas, right? 
So if you drop us in there, we will disappear and never be found again, all right? So we will have to look for projects that are scaled to our abilities, our capabilities. But there will be some things. I'm quite sure about it. The problem is that the business environment in most of Central Asia is not yet really such to be attractive to many uh, Singapore entrepreneurs. You have to... It's moving in the right direction, but it's not there yet. And don't forget, potential investors, potential entrepreneurs have many regions to choose from. This is a globalized age still, despite Mr. Trump's best efforts. It's still a globalized effort, so they don't have to go to Central Asia. They don't have to go to any particular place. They can find opportunities everywhere. But there will be opportunities. The Belt and Road can't take up everything, and I don't think Central Asian countries want the Belt and Road projects to take up everything either. They want balance too. Thank you for your comment. I just want to quickly clarify. So you mean this uh, FTA signing with Eurasian Economic Union is mainly interested with Russia and Kazakhstan, and is this exclusively on the economic interest, or is there some political consideration? Course, Actually, I'm not really care about Central Asia. I'm just talking about the Eurasian Economic Union. Well, Eurasian Economic U Union precludes us sending, uh, assigning bilateral FTAs. We have to do it within that framework. So how can we go and uh, do it, you know? But be realistic, like, you know, look at you know, Armenia, Beautiful country too, nice wine, but it's a small economy. Kyrgyzstan, you got a you uh, you got a you got a very beautiful country, great tourism potential, but the development of that tourism potential may require some uh, investment. Maybe we can play a role. I don't know. So, it, but it's mainly economic. Uh, economics is strategy for a country like Singapore. You have been here maybe a year already. I think so. Uh, at least a year. So you should know that trade is 300 times our GDP. That is probably the largest ratio in the world. So we have to go outside and we have to look everywhere. And, you know, Eurasian Economic Union is a relatively untapped place for us to go and look for economic opportunity. Thank and you. And I think we will go there. Not right now because nobody can travel anywhere. That's very optimistic. So we are all looking for the vaccine and the opportunity to go and to see what, what can be done. We have next question in line from Artyom Kajokin, who is uh, representing Ernst and Young in Singapore. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And Artyom, uh, could you please turn on your mic and uh, ask your question. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, hi, Mr. Kosikin. I um, Yeah, it's true I'm senior manager in Ernst and Young Singapore. I um, have a question with you about international relationships where I have uh, quite limited knowledge, but um, in your publications and in your Facebook posts, one of the overarching themes is that foreign policy uh, should not be seen as a binary, like good or bad, red and blue. I can't hear you. Your but mic it, is... Uh, you are broken up. Your, your voice was not coming through clearly. Is it better now? Is it better? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'll just continue speaking. Um, so um, I was saying that from your publications, I yeah. see that there is an overarching point that foreign relationships are not a binary game, but it's a much more multifaceted process. Now, having that in mind and um, having, you know, the recent wave of negative news around uh, Russia, both in Western media and then also in Singapore newspapers, including Straight Times, etc. From Singapore perspective, uh, from foreign policy perspective, do you think that Russia still kind of follows some logical rules and um, can be trusted as a long-term partner? Or does this uh, wave of negative news somehow negatively affect the perception of Russia? Thank you. Well, that's one of the problems with Russia in Singapore that we get all our news from the Western, on the Russia from the Western media. And I, having lived in Russia and also having lived in the Soviet Union, know it is not so simple most of the time what the, the media portrays, right? I don't want to get into that because it take up all the time. But no, you look, you know, international relations, the basic concept is interest, national interest, right? If Russian interests and Singapore interests coincide, then definitely we can work together. <laughs> if they don't, we need not quarrel 
but we won't work together, that's all, right? You know, I'll give you an example. At the height of the Cold War, right, uh, vessels from the Soviet Merchant Marine came and be repaired in Singapore. Although clearly from a political point of view, our inclination was much more Western, although formally we are not not alike. And the United States wasn't very happy about that, but we still persisted. Why? It was in our interest. Uh, Russia originally, Soviet Union originally wanted to send vessels of its specific fleet, but that was maybe a stretch too far in that time, in the 1970s. But we came to a, a mutually beneficial compromise that um, we could work together on the, Russia, the Soviet Merchant Marine. Keppel Shipyard, let me tell you something, learn to build. Keppel Shipyard is one of the few shipyards in the world that can build extreme weather vessels. Ice, ice breakers, as well as oil rigs that can, uh, that can work at extremely low temperatures. Where did we learn this expertise? We learned this expertise from working with the Soviet Union. So we worked because it was in our mutual interest to do these things together. The concept, is always interest, nothing else. Okay, uh, our time is uh, running up very quickly, but we have uh, two very interesting questions. One post in our chat room, uh, because uh, the person who is asking, uh, Yevgeny Zaryanov from the Alexander Gurchikov Public Diplomacy Foundation, uh, unfortunately cannot ask it by the voice uh, due to his bad internet connection. So I will ask in his stead. So uh, the question is that, um, the question is about the non-governmental public organizations in Singapore and other ASEAN countries uh, working in the public diplomacy field. So, uh, Mr. Kosikin, are you aware of any institutions of the civil society uh, which will be willing to cooperate with similar Russian uh, counterparts, uh, non-profit uh, civil organizations, in, in order to develop international ties between civil societies on, of Russia and ASEAN? So that's uh, Yevgeny's question. Well, I don't know of any, actually, not in the specific field of public diplomacy. I know of some uh, Western commercial firms that do public diplomacy, or they say they do. Uh, they, one of them, for example, publishes an index on soft power and things like that. But they are not an NGO, they are a commercial entity, so they'll work with you if you pay them. You know, which I don't think is what you have in mind. Uh, NGOs, actually, I don't know. Uh, I don't know any, in, I'm pretty sure there are none in Singapore in the field of public diplomacy. And I can't think of any in the other ASEAN countries either. I'm sorry, can't help you there. There are, however, think tanks, for example, uh, that would work with think tank, with uh, Russian think tanks, you know, uh, on public diplomacy, but they are not really NGOs. They are usually part of universities or or you know, or, or independent foundations, things like that. Okay, there is a question uh, which is posted via our Facebook page where we have your uh, talk uh, live streamed. And uh, the uh, person who is asking this question is Mr. Nikolai Shiraev uh, from the Ministry of Economic Development of uh, Russian Federation, who is currently based in Thailand. So he asks, um, the following question. Despite what you say about ASEAN trying to search for balance in its international relations, we can see that in many countries of the region, some ideas have been dominating the media space for years. Most of the rhetoric has not changed since the end of the Cold War. I cannot recall a book named ASEAN in the Shadow of Washington or Eagle's Shadow over ASEAN. Still, a dragon euphemism is used quite often, reminding of the titles of the old Soviet propaganda books. Um, so, uh, to make uh, the long story short, do you think there is a dire need for diversity of views as the public opinion towards many issues in the world is changing rapidly? So, is there any request for alternative thinking uh, and representation in the media? Well, I think the media is a fact of life that the global media is is dominated by the West. Right? Uh, there are very few people in Southeast Asia that will look at the Russian media. There are much more that will look at Chinese media, but the West, the global media is still a very Western media. That's a fact of life. Right? 
that's also why you have embassies and, and, and so on around the world that are supposed to try to compensate for this to some degree. It's not a, a, a problem unique to Russia or, or China or anything. I mean, Singapore too sometimes has a bit of difficulty getting its views reflected in the Western media, all right? That's a fact of life. You've got to accept it and work with it, you know? There's no point just grumbling about it. You've got to find some way around it if you can. But I don't think the Western media, I mean, if you look at the people in the think tank circuit, for example, uh, people in governments, I don't think they are all that naive that just to believe everything they, they read in the New York Times, say, or, or Washington Post, or, or watch on BBC, or, or things like that. You know, I mean, people who understand international relations, who follow international relations, uh, use the Western media as one input. And they will also go and think through the issues for themselves and find other sources of, um, of information. But you're certainly right as far as general public opinion, because in every country of the world, I dare say in Russia too, in fact, I know in Russia too, most people, the general person in the street is not particularly interested in international relations. So he tends to take the most convenient source of information. That's true in Singapore, that's true in China, that's true in Russia, that's true even in the United States. But I think in Southeast Asia, among people who are interested, we are not so silly as just to rely on one source of information, convenient though it may be. So let me pose the final question uh, before we uh, finish our very interesting event. And this is a question uh, which comes from Ms. Ksenia Yegorova, uh, who is a Russian lady but is currently based in Indonesia and a student of Indonesian, uh, one of the Indonesian universities. So she cites the, um, uh, the claim which was made uh, by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of China, saying that if we can manage the issue of the South China Sea well, it will make the bilateral picture shine. However, if we can't, then the picture will dim. So knowing that the South China Sea is a non-negotiable issue for China, China sticks to its primordial perspective, giving a historical argument, uh, probably the historical uh, uh, rights um, are uh, met here. Seems like China won't give up its national interests. Don't you think that the statement from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of China openly frets ASEAN? What solutions would you offer to solve this issue as a regional organization? So, million cost question and here. <laughs> a pain for your thoughts, Mr. Is very simple. I mean, when Mr. Wang Yi says if the issue is handled correctly or whatever he said, it means something very simple. It means handled according to China's wishes, right? That means very clear. Uh, however, it has not gone all according to China's wishes. South China Sea has actually quite damaged um, China's reputation, including among people who are not um, are not claimant states. But it can be managed for one very simple reason. That simple reason is called the Seventh Fleet. When you're dealing with hard power, hard power has to be balanced off with hard power. It is also now an international issue. You have Japan trying to play a role. You have Australia playing some kind of role. You have Indonesia pushing back. You have Vietnam and Malaysia also taking a harder position, right? When small countries deal with big countries on issues like this, they have to deal with it in a broader multilateral framework. We cannot deal with this on a bilateral basis. You deal with this on a bilateral basis, you are done for, right? But the South China Sea is now an international issue. It is an issue of international concern, whether the Chinese like it or not. The main hard balancing force is the Seventh Fleet. I see no sign of the Seventh Fleet willing to concede. Uh, China, of course, is not going to change its position, right? It can't, you know? Uh, but as long as the Seventh Fleet is there, uh, more or less, it's a strategic stalemate, a strategic stalemate in which other countries are interested and claimant states cannot be picked off one by one in darkness. So I think that is the situation in the South China Sea. Nobody is asking China to withdraw its claims. It won't. But as I once told my Chinese counterpart, who now happens to be the foreign minister when he was the SOM leader, 
Uh, you know, you base yourself on history, you place your claims on history, you just scare the living daylights about everybody because your history is such that you can claim half the world. You can claim all of Southeast Asia. So why do you want to base your claim on something that can only cause anxieties, not just in Southeast Asia, everywhere? Now, Russia and, uh, Russia and China have settled the border quite some time ago, and that's a good thing. But I'm sure many Russians who study this do not forget Mao Zedong's famous quote <laughs> uh, about everything from Baikal to the Pacific ones belonging to China and the bill not yet being presented. And in fact, it's a living issue because, I mean, nobody's going to revive that claim. Huh? I don't think the Chinese are so daft as to revive that claim. But do you remember what happened just a few months ago, beginning of this year, when the Russian embassy in Beijing put out some video about Vladivostok and the Chinese social media got really upset with it. So these things are sensitive. You know, they, why, I, I never got a good answer, by the way, why you want to base your claims or uh, put your claims on a basis that will just upset everybody without really advancing your claim. Anyway, that's my answer. I think the South China Sea is a settled issue. The new issue is going to be on land and has to do with the dams that China is building in the upper reaches of the Mekong. They have caused severe environmental damage downstream. Thank you, Mr. Bilahari. We have um, several um, questions lined up in the chat, but unfortunately our uh, regular class time has uh, run out. So my deep apologies to Lili Ong, um, to those who wanted to pose more questions, but I think that uh, it seems that uh, your talk inspired real interest and uh, many thoughts coming from different uh, parts of this world. There we are in a way restricted uh, with our capacity to reach out, but new opportunities like inviting you via uh, online uh, instruments via Zoom emerged and we are sincerely thankful for your talk, for your time that you decided to spend your nice Singaporean afternoon with us. Uh, so uh, please believe me that our on-site audience is joining um, me in thanking you for, for this endeavor, and we hope that we will have the opportunity to see you and to talk to you probably uh, in in more well informal and personal way when uh, when we will not to have to use the computer uh, instruments to get reconnected. So thank you, Mr. Bilahari. I hope so too. I hope so too. Thank <laughs> so, you for inviting me, and thank Victor for inviting me. Sure, uh, he's now attending a meeting in Eurasian Economic Union, so hopefully he will be coming up with the practical and viable ideas how to build our future together. And people in the chat are saying... People in the chat are uh, thanking you as well, uh, our audience, thanks to our very active uh, audience, interested audience, um, who genuinely following uh, who are following the relations between Russia and Southeast Asia and Southeast Asian affairs. So thanks to everyone and we hope to see you all in, in, in our future events and we will be happy to share the announcements. Thank you, Mr. Bilahari. We are about to okay, disconnect bye -bye. now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.